in our eyes that we may see glimpses of who we're meant to be. Place in our hands the wonderful key that shall unclasp and set us free. Here with these friends we wait for thee. Ready, O oh God, new truth to see. Come walk among this company. Spirit divine. Open our ears that we might hear voice of of truth thou sendest clear. Then when the wave notes fall on the ear, everything false will disappear. Here with these friends we wait for thee. Pretty oh God, no truth. Walk among this company, Spirit Divine. Open our mouths that we might share gladly the great truth everywhere. Open our hearts and let us prepare. Thus with God's children love to share. Here with these friends we wait for thee. Help us, O oh God, new truth to see. Come walk among this company.
somebody save me It's getting late now Here we come, oh yeah Here we come With these hands We'll build the bridges Welcome to another broadcast in our Turning Points series. For the last few weeks, we've been talking about turning points. It's a, it's a new year still, uh, and goodness, we've seen some turning points this week, haven't we? Um, I really would love to get stories from you about significant turning points in your life. When was a time when things changed, when you took a new direction, when you had one of those moments when you understood something that you hadn't quite got before? And I'd love for you to send it to us because we love those stories. Uh, my guest today has had some significant turning points in his life, so we're going to talk about that. We're focusing today on different understandings. What's it like when you understand something you couldn't quite get before? When you do the work, you make the effort, you take the time, you have the patience to get what you just didn't get before. Like this. I saw you in the darkness. I saw you, you were looking for me. When you turned your light on, well, my poor blind eyes began to see.
So many times I've heard your voice Seems that this time there was something much more This was the time I made my choice Right now, I know you, and I'm beginning to see that you're opening my eyes, and you are making the song out of me. You're making a song out of me. story for kids between the ages of hmm and hmm. If you have kids in the house, you might want to call them over because this could be fun. This is all about different understanding. It's called Robin and the Green Balloon. <laughs> ten-year-old girl you might know. She did ordinary things that ten-year-olds do. Maybe you know some ten-year-olds too. Maybe they go to school. Maybe now online. I don't know the same ten-year-olds you do. Maybe at night a good dinner, or maybe at night, her family's still hungry. Maybe when she goes to bed, she has a nice stuffed animal to play with, or maybe not. Maybe she has brothers or sisters, or maybe not. I don't know, but this much I know. Robin is ten. Now, during the day, Robin does what other ten-year-olds do, but at night, ah, this is where everything changes because at night, Robin is a secret adventurer. And her partner on these great adventures where she goes to new worlds and new places never known before, her partner is a great green balloon. And every night when Robin goes to bed, 
the great green balloon parks outside the bedroom window, just out of sight. So that by the time everything is dark and, and everybody else in the house has gone to bed, the balloon scrapes against the window. It's time, Robin, it's time. And Robin grabs some clothes and she opens the big bedroom window and grabs the string of the balloon and together they go whoosh, flying far, 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 far away from the house, far away from the city, far away even from the country. Where are we going tonight, said Robin. Oh, you'll see, said the great green balloon. Hold your breath and quick as a wink. They're flying above a world far, far light years away. We're going to land, said the balloon, and they land in this new, strange, wonderful world. And the ground is like a big trampoline and you can leap, leap, leap anywhere. We have a long way to go, said the balloon. And they're leaping and flying and leaping and flying until they come to a village. And the village has all kinds of tiny houses. And in those tiny houses live tiny, tiny people. Oh my goodness, said Robin. I've never seen so many tiny people in all my life. Well, said the balloon, they don't think they're tiny. They think you're a giant of some sort. And all the people had indeed gone into their houses to hide because they were confronted by this huge giant and this unbelievably huge green balloon. Robin came to the window of one of the houses and knocked on the window. Hello, hello. Go away, somebody said. Go away, you giant. You're just like all the other people who came to visit us. They came in a great ship and they visited for a while, these big giants, and then they left. But the problem was they left a huge monster that comes around every day and scares us. A monster, said Robin. Oh, I wasn't prepared to deal with a monster. And the balloon said, you just wait. And so in the middle of the darkest night, Everybody waited. The little people waited inside their houses, hoping that the monster wouldn't come and take their house down. And Robin waited to be confronted by this awful monster that these people who visited the planet had left in their big, out of their big ship. And so it wasn't long before Robin heard animal footsteps. And then the monster came around the corner. And the monster made its monster sound. Roof! And Robin leapt out from where she was hiding. Oh my goodness, she said. This is no monster. This is a great, wonderful, big old German shepherd dog with a message on her collar. And the message says, we left this for you. We left this friend for you because on the planet where we come from, the dog is considered to be human's best friend. And so we left you a brand new friend. Come out of your houses, said Robin. This is no monster at all. This is a big old friendly German shepherd dog. Do you have any food for him to eat? And they gave her some wonderful food. And all night long, they had a great party. And the children got on the dog's back and they rode the dog all around. And there was laughing and singing and dancing and barking and music. It was a wonderful celebration. And in the middle of it all, the balloon said, Uh-oh, Robin, it's time to go back home. I don't want to go home, said Robin. I'm having much too much fun. Sorry, said the balloon, we got to go. And so Robin grabbed the string. Off they were, flying again, flying again. Take a deep, deep breath. Ready? Quicker than a wink, Robin was back above her bedroom, just outside the window. Holding onto the string, she crawled through the window, let go of the string, and dropped onto the bed. And the balloon just disappeared in time to hear Mom call, Robin! Time to get ready for school! 
Robin came down to breakfast that morning. That day there was breakfast. Some days, some days not. How was your night last night, Robin? Said Mom. Oh, it was a great night. I had, I had a wonderful adventure. Mom said, I'm so glad I have a daughter who dreams great dreams. Sometimes I think I know the answers Sometimes I think I've got it all in hand Sometimes I think I know exactly what's going on Sometimes I think I understand just don't wait quite long enough because I think I know what's really going on when I take the time to stop and think and turn let expectations drop then it's just like seeing a brand new dawn. Keep me from making snap decisions. Keep me from thinking everything is all in hand. Give me the patience. When I was a boy, I was a good church kid. I grew up in a church that had quite a complicated belief system. I grew up in a Dutch Calvinist community and we had, oh my goodness, we had, we had beliefs from now till next Tuesday. We, we had to learn about election and we had to learn about predestination and we had to learn about substitutionary atonement, all those words that probably a lot of you don't even know. And it was, you know, it was complicated. And it was mechanical and we had all this stuff about Jesus being human and divine and fully God and fully man and no, no, no. And it went on and on and on and on. In high school, I ran away from that faith. And when I came back, it was quite different. It was not the same as the faith of my childhood at all. I said a little while ago in an article in Homiletics Magazine, I'm much more interested in Jesus' humanity than I am in Jesus' divinity. And I got in trouble for that. What I was trying to say is, I've discovered the Jesus who is a human. Not the Jesus who was perfect and sinless. Not the Jesus who was the atonement because God was so angry with people that, that somebody had to be punished. The Jesus who was a man who loved, who cared, who learned, who knew, who, 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 who trained and taught and discovered and had his own mind changed. That's the Jesus now I want to follow. That's the Jesus who is my teacher, my leader, my guide. That's the Jesus about whom I want to continue to learn. I'm definitely a Christian, but my Christianity is not like that that I knew. And yet still, I can sing that old chorus I have decided to follow Jesus. 
I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning. Oh!
my guest today, I can say a lot about him. I can tell you he's a wonderful singer, songwriter, and a terrific guitar player. I can tell you that he is a pastor. I can tell you that he is an innovator when it comes to music. We'll talk about that in a while. I can tell you that he is a man of great compassion. I can tell you that he does work in the country of Haiti to help all kinds of folks uh, with uh, lots of different issues. We'll talk about that too. I can tell you about him as a thinker, as a, as a man of, of deep conviction. But what I want to tell you most of all is that Brian Sergio is my friend. He's somebody I admired for years. I loved his music. I loved his courage. And then a few years ago, we actually were able to meet. I think it was at a conference. And now we get to work on some projects together. So I want to introduce this wonderful, wonderful audience, Brian, to you. Folks, meet my friend, Brian Sergio. Hi, Brian. Hey there, Ken. How are you be, man? Well, I'm fantastic. I'm just, you know, uh, typically blown away by just listening to you. I feel like, what, what the heck you got me on here for now? We, we just need more of you. But you didn't get oh, yeah. ask me to, to uh, sing your praises, so I'll, I'll be quiet and, and, I, I, and, and I, go, I, go I, along I, here. I wanted, you, I wanted you because uh, we're talking about turning points in this program today. Yeah. And I, I wanted to know... Um, some of those turning points in your life. You, you, uh, you are not like a lot of songwriters that we know in the Christian contemporary music world. Um, the path you have chosen is quite a different one. You've chosen to write songs uh, that dare to, to, to be inclusive when it comes to language. You've chosen to write songs that are preoccupied with issues of justice, You've chosen to write songs that are uh, probably not going to be big money makers in the Christian contemporary world. What in the world led you, first of all, led you into music? And then what led you to take this unusual kind of step in this direction? What were the turning points there? Well, you know, I, I always made up music. I'm not trained, you know, as a musician. I, I can barely read music. So I, I always refer to myself as kind of a ham and egger on the musical spectrum. Um, but, you know, I was always making up songs as a little kid, got to be a teenager. And, and just as a way of expressing what was going on in my, my inner world, I started writing songs, uh, playing in bands, you know, just did that whole thing. But, but expressing myself musically was always what would, the, the way in which my emotional intensity would come out. And then I had a conversion experience when I was about 17. And, uh, you know, I didn't grow up going to church at all. And, and, uh, but so I started writing songs that were reflective of that early, that, that initial, uh, Christian experience, spiritual yeah. experience. Yeah. And then when I started thinking about going into ministry, started using the, the music in ministry, I actually went to seminary, became a pastor, uh, years ago. I've been around for a while now, but years ago, I was pastor of two little churches in Northern Wisconsin. And, and I was, I mean, I was aware of the contemporary Christian music world. My, my seminary training took me in a direction where the theology and the language and the messages didn't really fit in that that uh, contemporary Christian music world much. Although I did try to to uh, you know interface with it, um, did try to get a job as a writer with some of the companies in Nashville, and was always around the edges of that. And then publishers would tell me, "Hey, you know, you, you need to," as one publisher put it, "you need to write a little more plain vanilla." You know, your, your, your stuff has an edge on it. And, and, they say, and they would always say, you know, personally, I like the edge, but I can't get that cut. No one's going to, you know, it's going to sing that. It's not going to fit on our radio format. And I finally just decided, um, well, number one, as a pastor, I was writing songs that were supplementing my messages all the time. And I found that the people in my church were seeming to remember and get more out of the songs than the sermons. And, um, and, and, and I just realized that I couldn't do both with the focus and intensity and fullness that I wanted to. And then, um, and then I realized that the songs I was writing, even though I never had any illusions about being a great artist or voice or anything myself, but um, I played and sang them just because no one else would. And I realized it was a better use of my time and energy creatively to just sing the stuff that God was laying on my heart to sing um, in these, into these issues and, and with edges that other people didn't seem to have. And to just see what would happen with that. And so I started my own artistry and wound up doing that full time for 31 years. Oh, 
So, sing us a song. <laughs> sing us a song with Edge. Well, Show well. Show us the kinds of things you're doing. All right. Well, I mean, I don't know how much of an edge this one has, but um, you know, I'm a I'm a pastor again now, and writing songs more um, for congregational singing. Initially, my ministry was more solo oriented, and you know, I could sing a lot of edgy songs as far as that goes. But um, just recently, um, just in these past couple of days, I wrote a little song um, that came out of the events that we've all been experiencing recently, and my own sense of how important it is to tell the truth, and. And, uh, and how dangerous it is when lies are passed on and believed and built on and reacted to. Um, and, you know, we all have witnessed the, the last couple of months and the last few weeks and the pain of all that. Um, and it made me think about Jesus uh, in the Gospel of John talking about uh, the truth will make you free. Um, so... This song, I just, uh, this is the debut of this song, which was my way of saying, I'll probably screw it up and make some mistakes, but, but here you okay. go. We do that here. God help our eyes to see through the lies, clear away clouds of deceit. God help our eyes see through the disguise when wolves are dressed up like sheep. Sometimes it's logs in our own eyes that make it hard to see that only the truth makes us free. Sometimes the lie is just standing by When we know it's time to act Failing to speak is falsehood When we are trying to skirt some fact With love and grace we must call for Accountability the truth makes us free. God help our eyes to see through the lies that tear apart neighborhood. Help us to heal by knowing what's real and best for the common good. Help us to serve one another in true community, building on truth makes us free, only the truth makes us free. It, I like it, and we we get to be the place where it's debuted. <laughs> that is awesome. Uh, yeah. yeah, I sort of I sort of don't think that's going to get number one on the contemporary Christian hit parade. Probably not. <laughs> no. And and you know um, I've had, of course, my experience is somewhat similar. When I started writing songs about social justice and whatever, the record company that I was attached to said, "Yeah, nice record, but justice won't sell." Right. So. So I want to ask you another. I want to ask you about another turning point. You are. Uh, well, before we leave music, I want. I want to talk about the Convergence Music Project. Um, you and I are are part of a group of songwriters uh, who are really trying to become a kind of an unusual uh, publishing group in that uh, we're not. We're not working like other companies do. Um, we're our whole way of of contracting with each other is different. But but the main thing about Convergence Music Project is that we're writing songs like the song you just heard, folks. Songs about community, songs about justice, songs with inclusive language. 
songs that explore new imagery for, for God and for what our faith is all about. Uh, Brian is the, was, the, was the, one of the first founders of the Convergence Music Project. And we're fortunate to have some wonderful writers, um, Christopher and Richard and Andra and Brian McLaren is also working with us and, and Gary and Lenore Rand and the many. Quite a crew of composers and, and writers. And Brian, if, if people wanted to check into what CMP is doing, how would they do that? Well, it's a website, first and foremost. So the, the URL is, the, is Convergence MP for Music Project, convergencemp.com. And, uh, and there's a, web, a video on the homepage that will tell you all about the vision of the company. But really, it's about trying to be a resource for songs, primarily for congregational singing, for churches that are looking for music with lyrics that are, as you said, that have inclusive language, um, more expansive theology, that are sensitive to some doctrinal issues like like uh, substitutionary atonement, etc., um, and and trying to be a more just and generous expression of the faith and provide a source of songs that people can trust have have been uh, evaluated and curated so that they they line up with those priorities um, way, and lots of different uh, styles and traditions and, and uh, represented. Yeah. By the way, you wrote a book too about this, didn't you? Yeah, The Six Marks of Progressive Christian Worship Music, it, and, uh, which is really a resource to, to facilitate a conversation initially among, among clergy and worship band musicians who did not understand why clergy often didn't like the lyrics of some of the, the worship songs they were bringing from the more evangelical CCM world um, and why they didn't fit more progressive congregations or, or inclusive congregations. Um, yeah. So, so folks, check out check out uh, convergence, um, MP .com. I think you'll find some really rich resources. Now, Brian, I want to ask you about another turning point. I know <laughs> that you one of the one of the things you're involved in deeply, deeply, deeply is the work that you're doing in Haiti. Yeah. And I want to know how that came to be. What what was the what was the turning point? What was the experience that made you say, you know what, of all this stuff I got to do, I'm a pastor, I'm a songwriter, I've got this music company, but I've got to do this work in Haiti. What happened there? Well, you know, in a general sense, I, I had this, this uh, theological awakening during seminary, which really opened up the gospel of justice and, and trying to transform this world rather than escape it and challenging um, a gospel that, that seemed to historically con constantly be on the side of the wealthy or that the institutions were co-opted. So all those sensibilities led me to realize that it was a healthy thing when possible to get out of this culture and, and to try to in a sense, uh, borrow the eyes of the poorest of the poor. And you don't have to leave the United States to do that. I mean, we all know there's there's uh, poverty in just about every city and, and rural area of this country. But Haiti, um, statistically, was represented the bottom of the bottom, socioeconomically poorest country in the Western Hemisphere at the time. Uh, this was 30 years ago when I first went. And there was an organization affiliated with the Church of the Savior in Washington, D.C., that, that took trips um, that they referred to as reverse mission pilgrimages. And I loved the concept um, it, where they felt like, you know, the poor in so-called third world countries don't need us to go down there and, quote, help them. And, and they challenged the condescension and arrogance of, of so much short-term mission work and just said, what we need to do is be evangelized by the poorest of the poor to experience the life and their worldview and their faith. Anyway, I love the model, went on one of those trips and, and uh, had no intention of Haiti stealing my heart the way it did. Um, but that's, you know, that's what, what happened when I first uh, got there. And, and just learning from Haitians that I got to meet and got to know who became personal friends of mine, um, who taught me uh, what what life felt like from the bottom of the bottom socioeconomically and and challenged me to take a look at some of my presuppositions. So that, I mean that's how that all began and and there was a, you know a zillion stories I could tell you. I mean when I said before so-called third world, one of my Haitian friends one time speaking to a group I was leading said, uh, please stop using those terms, first word and third, third world. We would pr prefer that you use the terms the plundered and the plundering world. At least it's historically accurate. You know? and, 
And so things like that, where you just stop and uh, yeah. the world would stop for a moment and you'd have to, to reevaluate. So, I mean, that's how it, that's how it began. Um, and I got to know people and was invited into a community and developed relationships and, and started to respond. And the last thing I'll just say quickly is that it, it really changed my reference point and mm -hmm. really the, the focus of my life to have friends who would have to listen to their children cry themselves to sleep because they hadn't eaten that day or maybe for several days. Um, and so it, it personalized all of those issues for me. And um, one thing led to another and just been relating ever since. Yeah, and there you are. You know, I wonder, I wonder if you've got one more song in you for us. Hmm. Is that a possibility? Well, um, Want me to do something connected to, to Haiti? Yeah, I the, love um, that. I'd love right, that. I'd quickly retune. <laughs> On the last night of a trip I took to Haiti I was driving down these crowded city streets I can still see the diesel fumes lingering in the headlights And I can still see that little girl's bare feet And she was wearing a tattered yellow dress And she was four or five years old, I would guess Another orphan street kid working hard to just survive. And to be honest, I was hoping to drive right by. But the traffic was gridlocked to a standstill. And when she noticed my white skin, she came real quick. She leaned up against my window, and then with one little hand, she pointed back and forth from her belly to her lips At first she seemed a little bit too practiced At pulling strings of guilt and sympathy And then I'm not sure why But I looked right into her eyes And as I did, these words washed over me I see you, I see you, hey little girl, I won't pretend that you're not there, I see you, I see you, little girl Christ, I see you. People tell me, please don't give these street kids money. It just perpetuates their cruel dependency. And to be honest, I didn't like the thought of pulling out my wallet. You never know who else is working these crowded streets. Compassion sure was feeling complicated. Mother Teresa called these kids Christ in disguise But there was nothing that seemed right To try to do for her that night Except to try to tell her with my eyes I see you I see you Hey little girl I won't pretend that you're not there I see you I see you Little girl Christ I see you And how often I have quoted that familiar cold statistic 32,000 children starve to death each day a few more years, some high heel shoes and lipstick And little girls will do what they must do Just to still the hunger pains 
one more day. Well, I could tell the traffic up ahead was moving. And she and I kept looking eye to eye. And when the moment finally came to take my foot off of the brake, she shrugged her shoulders and cracked this little smile. And as I drove away, I made a promise. Hey, little girl, I never will forget your face. And I'll do what's mine to do To change this world for kids like you and When I hear 32,000 I remember you and say I see you I see you Hey little ones I won't pretend that you're not there We see you we see you, little child Christ, we see you. Brian, on behalf of all who listen today, all the people in all those living rooms, I would like right now to thank you for bringing us into your soul's deep home. Brian, we have felt some of your passion Brian, we have heard the song you sing. Brian, we have felt your beating heart. Boom, 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 boom. You have taught us many things. Brian, let us thank you one more time for the privilege of being together and being friends. We'll do some work together in the days ahead, and I hope this camaraderie never ends. I see you, I see you, and now these other friends have seen you too. Now these friends have got a taste of you. We won't forget. We will remember. We won't forget. And we'll do what we must do to change the world we live in. To change the way we live in it. And partially We see you. Thanks, brother. Thank you, Brian Sergio. Friends, uh, if you would like to donate to the work that you're seeing happen here, uh, I've, I've talked about this many times before. All these concerts are sponsored by our nonprofit called Interlude Retreats, interluderetreats.org. Uh, you can donate there. People have been so, so helpful. Some people donate lots of money. Some people donate, you know, a few dollars. We have uh, some friends who donate three bucks a month, four bucks a month, five bucks. And then we have some who, who've given us thousands. But for uh, almost a year now, Interlude has sponsored all these concerts and all this work. Generally, uh, Interlude does retreats for church musicians, and we've done three of those retreats in the last year now. Interlude also sends me to small churches that have no money. In fact, I went to Brian's church, uh, what, a year and a half ago, maybe, or two years ago, something like that. Anyway, 
went to Brian's church, uh, and we and we were able to do a whole weekend there of music in this tiny church in, in Madison. So um, I'd love for you to uh, become a partner. Uh, I'd love for you to write me some stories about turning points in your life. Uh, and I'd like for you to know that next week, uh, our special guest will be Jim Wallace. Many of you know Jim Wallace as the former editor and uh, of Sojourners magazine. He now is embarked on a very exciting adventure at Georgetown University, which we'll talk about next week. Uh, you may have seen Jim uh, in the last couple of days. He, he was one of the prayers at the prayer service this morning, the virtual prayer service. He's been uh, so much involved in the life in Washington, D.C. and all over the world, uh, being a, a, a prophet, um, a spokesman for the Christian way. And as important as all of that is that he's my friend. So next week, it's Jim Wallace, and I'd love to get some stories of turning points from you. And uh, we'll close like this. <laughs> spirit in this place Holy One listen to your children praying Send us love Send us power Send us grace Come down spirit like a rock rolling down the hill Crush the head of the serpent Until the serpent is a lion still Oh, come down spirit Like a rock on which we stand Lift our feet from the miry clay And from the sinking sand Come down spirit Like a great refiner's fire Burn the dross and keep the gold, let the flames leap higher and higher. Come down, spirit, like a fire in a winter storm. Melt the ice within us and turn our cold to warm. And the people sang, Holy One. Listen to your children praying, yeah. Holy One, send your spirit in this place. Holy One, listen to your children praying. Send us love, send us power, send us grace. Take the time to learn what you didn't know. Take the time to understand the people that you haven't understood. Write me some stories and come back in a week. Bye.